Welcome to Basic Training. The Wedding Ceremony. There are a lot of really strange ideas out there about what a wedding ceremony is and how we do it. The composition of families in the United States has changed significantly over the past 50 years. These changes have resulted in a delay in the age of getting married for the first time. Yeah, I said the first time because the number of multiple marriages is also greatly increased. There's been a steep rise in the divorce rate. Recently, there's been a plateauing or even a little decline, but that has a lot to do with the fact that people aren't getting married anymore. Uh, there's a lower fertility rate. The number of children being born in families has drastically reduced. There's a tremendous increase in cohabitation, and there's a much higher proportion of births outside of marriage and within cohabiting unions or even within homosexual relationships. There's also been an increasing number of first births to older women. All these are being tracked by the Census Bureau, of all things. You can go to the United States Census Bureau, and they are tracking all sorts of weird things because we've become very unusual in our habits of marriage. Really, in Western civilization, since the birth of Christ, this is an entirely weird thing that has not been healthy for society and it hasn't been healthy for the individuals. And of course, in many cases, it's been an abomination to the Lord. While research has shown that both cohabitors and unmarried, non-cohabiting individuals have lower household income than married persons. As a matter of fact, divorce and single parenthood is among the poorest of the people in our country. Cohabiting men and women are much more supportive of the idea of premarital cohabitation, the idea of living together before marriage. And they do this because they think it might prevent divorce, and they're much more in favor of raising children in these cohabiting unions that have not gotten married. Compared with the married and unmarried, non-cohabiting adults are like this. A big part of the problem is that the church has lost the understanding of, mar of the marriage ceremony as a covenant. And it's not only a covenant but it's a covenant that is entirely related to the headship of the male. This, is according, this headship is according to the pattern of Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, very important foundational text, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. So in other words, headship is throughout creation. In Ephesians chapter 5, we read this, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And then husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So you see this idea of headship and the duty of the head and the duty of those under the head is exactly related to Christ as head. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. Uh, skipping down to verse 28, he who loves his own wife loves himself. In other words, the wife and her body is the same as the husband and his own body because the two have become one flesh. So by loving my wife, and loving her body, I am loving myself and my own body. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 23-32. So there's two patterns laid out for us uh, in Scripture as models for a husband's headship. The first is as God, as the Father and Head of Christ. 
uh, though this is not specifically mentioned as a pattern for human headship in Scripture, there are three elements that are clearly typical of the marriage relationship uh, and are reflected in the marriage ceremony. The first is the mystery of the union. In the Godhead, the mysterious union is the Trinity. And Scripture specifically defines union of a husband and wife becoming one flesh as a profound mystery. That's in Ephesians 5.32. New American Standard puts it like this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. So this becoming one flesh is a mystery, and it is parallel to and symbolic of the mystery of the Trinity. The second pattern is that the this union is an organic union. The, the Son proceeds from the Father. It's impossible to conceive of God outside of the headship of the Father and the Sonship of Christ. God otherwise would not be God. This is why Unitarians, who reject the deity of Christ, are not accepted even by the National Council of Churches as being a Christian faith, because they deny the Godhead of Christ and that he proceeds from the Father. So this organic relationship. Uh, and the third is sovereign headship. God is king of Christ as his father. Christ repeatedly in the gospel said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me, meaning his father. And so that means Christ is obeying God the father. So that's the first pattern is of God God is the Father of Christ. The second pattern is Christ as the head of the church that I just read from uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Christ is mysteriously united with the bride. We are his body. This is an organic union. The great feast in eternity when the final victory is won over Satan is called the marriage feast of the Lamb. So in other words, this is a wedding ceremony. But we are Christ in us is our hope of glory, and so it's an organic union. In Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. This is the wedding dress that the, that the bride wears. For fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And finally, Christ is our sovereign, our Lord. So the same three myths, the mysterious union, the organic union, and the sovereign head uh, are patterns for the husband with the wife as revealed in Scripture and are played out in, in a biblical wedding ceremony. In the Protestant uh, version of this, to bring these ideas in symbolically to the actual wedding is a uh, what I want to discuss with you. But before we do that, I have to say that marriage is a covenant, not a contract. And I want to tell you the difference between a covenant and a contract. A covenant is based on trust, a contract on distrust. Contract is made between two people because they don't trust each other. And it's it outlines penalties. A covenant, such as God makes with us, is entirely trustworthy, and as a matter of fact, God calls us to faith in his covenant with us, that we, we can and must trust him. Secondly, a covenant is based on unlimited responsibility. A contract, on the other hand, is based on limited liability. Unlimited responsibility versus limited liability. The, the contract spells out what that liability is, and marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant. Illustrate this. God's promise to Abraham actually was made to Abram before his name changed, and all he went through to keep his word demonstrate the unlimited responsibility, just as the traditional words for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, 
These talk about the unlimited responsibility. In other words, doesn't matter what the circumstances are, we're still responsible to the covenant. A covenant is lifelong and not to be broken. A contract can be voided by mutual consent. So uh, Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man uh, cast asunder. To illustrate this, God gave the covenant to Noah with its sign, the rainbow. The rainbow in the sky reminds everyone that God's covenant has no statute of limitations. Neither is marriage to have a limitation. So what is a covenant? A covenant is a solemn and binding agreement between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. And it's often instituted, especially in Scripture, with a sacrifice. Let me give you an example from uh, Genesis chapter 15. This is the Lord and Abram. And he took him outside and said, now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you were able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, that is Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, reckoned it to him, that is Abram, as righteousness. Paul quotes this verse in uh, Romans chapter 1. And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. It came about when the sun had set, skipping down to verse 17, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So did you get that? They made a sacrifice of these uh, these animals, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and they cut them and split the parts in two, making an aisle between them. The wedding aisle is the aisle of the covenant between the sacrificial animals that have been cut. So in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for covenant, berit, is related to a noun, barut, which means choice meat, and bira, which means fattened. So the idea of covenant has to do with choice meat, that is the meat of the sacrifice. There's another phrase, the Hebrew phrase karat berit, literally means to cut a covenant. The phrase make a covenant occurs 80 times in the Old Testament, and in every single incident, it literally means cut a covenant. And the the covenant is choice meat. So the idea of make a covenant is cut choice meat. In other words, the sacrifice that is cut and divided, making an aisle in between. In the sense of cutting The covenant is a compact made by passing between the pieces of flesh. The idea of the flaming torch was that God and Abram passed between the cut pieces of the sacrifice, and the promise then was made by God. It was not a mutual promise. It was not that Abram was to say, okay, well, if you'll do that, this is what I'll do. Abram's part was simply to obey God. God's part was to make the promise and the covenant, which was eternally true, and it was an eternal blessing, and this is the headship of the husband with his wife. And this has been so greatly diminished by our ceremonies and by our customs, and in fact, by most marriages. And so, as I long to share with you in the podcast about a husband and what the Bible has to say about how we can glorify God and bless our wives. It must start here with this idea of the ceremony. One of my advisors, when I was a freshman in college, told me the first meeting, he said, Bob, well begun is half done. And he was encouraging me to start well in my first semester in school. 
But I've never forgotten that, and I will say, well begun in marriage is half done. And you can't begin any better than having everyone, that is, the bride, the groom, and both parents, sets of parents, the best man, the, the maid of honor, understand that we're entering into a covenant ceremony. Uh, that's what the wedding is, and their responsibilities and the headship, the role of the groom in this, and of the father of the bride is very important. The covenant is instituted by two parties. There's other examples in scripture who would take a fatted animal, the best of the flock or herd, cut it into two pieces. Then the two parties of the covenant would pass through the pieces, symbolizing their dedication to the covenant. And by this action, they are saying, and this is radical, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that it's true. They're saying, if I do not hold to the agreements of this covenant, you can do to me what we did to this animal. You think this is radical? Jeremiah chapter 34. I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, this is the Lord speaking, those who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of this covenant, in other words, have not obeyed the covenant maker, who is God, which they have made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life and their dead bodies will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. In other words, by violating the covenant, they become Israel would become like the cut piece, pieces of choice meat of the sacrifice. This is serious stuff. You know, God doesn't change. In Malachi, I hate divorce. Now, another subject not for tonight, there is grace. We have forgiveness in Jesus Christ and his blood. We can find forgiveness. But even in forgiveness in divorce, it doesn't mean that that divorce is not a serious matter with serious ramifications that often go for generations. So what is a marriage covenant? Well, in the marriage covenant, the bride or groom make their way to the altar to exchange vows using separate aisles. This is like the Lord and Abram coming from opposite directions through the aisle between the cut parts of the animal to be joined in the middle. And what is the middle? The middle is the altar. <clears throat> the family sit on opposite sides of the church. Bride is on this side, the groom is on that side. What's that about? These are the witnesses, and they represent the sacrifice of the animal cut in two. And walking between the witnesses to this uh, covenant making, that it's not a private affair. It's not something done in the back seat of a car. It's something that is done publicly before the Lord, and it's a promise with the Lord, and it carries solemn responsibilities for both the husband and the wife. The ceremony is a solemn holy occasion, as the making of any covenant is. We are told by the Lord not to enter into covenants lightly. We are not to make vows lightly. God is the actor in the covenant with us, and the husband, the father first, and then the, the groom, the, the to-be husband, is the actor in the covenant of marriage. Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. It's a covenant. When half of all divorces occur within the first two years of marriage, this is astonishing. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20 says, it is a trap for a man to say rashly, it is holy, and after the vows to make iniquity. So what is it? We're not to rashly or easily enter into a covenant. You know, and people say, well, you know, that's not what I think. Well, actually, what we think doesn't matter. What matters is what God thinks. God will hold us to account for every word that comes out of our, our mouths. So the groom enters first, 
as the future head and as the initiator of the covenant. That's why the groom and the men come in first. Some people might say, well, he comes in first so he can watch the bride walk down the aisle. Well, that's a, that's a benefit as well, but it actually has to do with headship. The bride wears a white dress for purity. Remember the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation 19, where the, the bride, the church, is dressed in pure white, in pure linen. In other words, a fine fabric, which is the righteousness of the saints. And so this white dress stands for purity. This custom actually started more recently um, to be as consistent as it is. It did occur before 1840, but in 1840, uh, Queen Victoria of England, in her marriage to Albert, uh, dispensed with the common custom, which was to wear brightly colored clothes, and she put on a white dress. And she said it was to signify her virginity and her purity. And so, uh, of course, we're all sinners. And so as a Christian gets married, the bride may wear a white dress regardless because of trusting in Jesus' righteousness. The father of the bride, the head of the family, walks the bride down the aisle and gives her to the groom. He does this based on the groom's declaration before God of witnesses of his intention to enter into covenant with the father's daughter. The father gives the bride to the groom, transferring headship. The father as head has authority in the vows of his children. It's amazing to me how few even Christians know these things. Listen to this, Numbers chapter 30, starting at verse 4. And if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by an obligation in her father's house, in her youth, and her father hears her vow and her obligation by which she has bound herself, and her father says nothing to her, then all her vows shall stand, and every obligation by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father should forbid her, on the day he hears of it, none of her vows or her obligations by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will forgive her because her father has forbidden her. So you see, as far as God is concerned, the daughter only makes a vow at the permission of the father. This is why a man asks the father of the girl asks for her hand in marriage. This is God's will. Okay, the ring is a token of the covenant. And it's an unending circle, which again represents this lifelong uh, binding of the covenant. This is not an experiment, but it is a binding of two together by God. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The couple is then introduced in the wedding ceremony to establish the changing of the bride's name, as the couple is traditionally announced as Mr. and Mrs. Robert Forney, not using the, the bride's former surname or even the bride's first name often. Uh, and this is because now the bride's identity as one flesh is tied up in the identity of her husband. You see, men, this gives us responsibility. You say, well, isn't this nice privilege? No, we have the responsibility to love because when we love our wives, we're loving our own bodies. And when we forget this, because the culture no longer has symbols and words that, that remind us and declare truths that are from God and that don't change because God doesn't change and that he will hold us accountable to. So here's an illustration of this. Abram's name was changed by God to Abraham. God entered into a covenant with Abram and changed his name to Abraham. Uh, Abram fell on his face, uh, and God was talking with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So headship includes the, res the responsibility of naming and of uh, the wife. The, her first obedience is to take the name of her husband. This also 
incidentally, is very helpful for children. Uh, when people hyphenate names, what they're basically saying is, this isn't really the covenant. Well, that's nice, except that's not the way God looks at it. Uh, this doesn't mean that all of a sudden the, the union is egalitarian, as moderns would like to make it. God will still hold the husband to account because the husband is the head of the wife. It's not that he he becomes it somehow if he wants to. It's not because he feels like he's the head, but rather this is what he is, because God joins the two together and they become one flesh with the husband as the head. Okay, how about the guest book? The guest book often is signed as people come into the church, but technically it should be signed after the ceremony, not before. Why? Well, it indicates the witness to the covenant that by the guest signing, the, in fact, they have a guest book, is so that the covenant has signed witnesses. Now, there are different cultures that still incorporate this, that will have very fancy marriage documents and have uh, more than just the bride and the groom sign the marriage covenant. The Jews still do this, at least conservative and orthodox ones do. In Armenia, they have a low divorce rate. When the couple gets into trouble, the godparents, who are witnesses to the wedding ceremony, move in with the couple until they get it settled. This is taking this covenant very seriously. How about the couple feeding each other cake as they become one flesh? Well, remember that becoming one with the Lord is involved with eating the bread. You know, he says, take, eat, this is my body. So what matters to us is your current level of commitment within a marriage. Often the vows seem less vital and are less passionately held as time passes. So sadly, many only vaguely remember what they said. Our commitment should be active, not passive. You know, one can stay in a marriage being passive. He or she doesn't leave, but really doesn't do anything in line with their covenant vows. So having commitment means not just merely staying in the marriage. It means fulfilling the duties of the husband and the duties of the wife within the union. Uh, traditional vows have six separate parts, uh, and uh, they are, I will love you as long as we both shall live. This is uh, a, a kindness love I will cherish and honor you as long as we both shall live. This thoughtfulness and attentiveness. I will be to you what a husband or wife owes to the spouse. The dedication to doing my part. I will take you as you are. I will take you for my wife. I'll take you for my husband. I will, full, I will forsake all others. So acceptance and faithfulness. I will do all these things for better, for worse, in sickness and in health unconditionally serve and stay with you as long as we both shall live. So in the vows, they're actually vows of headship. The vow of the husband, as it was originally conceived in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, was a vow of headship, and the wife was a vow to obey. Again, a vow of headship. So what is a vow? A vow is a solemn promise or assertion, specifically one by which a person is bound to act, serve, live in this condition. The relationship defined in marriage is neither a matter of personal invention or opinion. Uh, Paul, again, in, in Ephesians 5, as I previously read, he who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And so this is a statement of being. It's not uh, for those who believe it to be true. It is part of creation. It's the way we are made. Miss Manners and Modern Weddings. Miss Manners is the name of a woman who wrote uh, books uh, about and columns and newspapers about etiquette. And Miss Manners made several observations about modern weddings. She said, in a house of worship, which figure represents the higher authority, 
the presiding member of the clergy, or the wedding coordinator, or I might add, or the mother of the bride. Miss Manners would not have thought this to be a particularly thorny protocol question. She would be mistaken. Everyone gets the answer wrong. The wedding coordinator, or I would say the mother of the bride, whether she is in the business professionally or for the purpose of being married, thinks it is she. And if the clerks, clerics don't actually voice agreement, an amazing number of them behave as if they regretfully believe this not to be the case. Miss Manners continues, There is nothing we can do. They wail when admitting that some of the arrangements strike them as being undignified, if not sacrilegious. That is, the clergy wail. That's what people want nowadays, is what they say. Miss Manners continues, Well, sure, people want to commit all kinds of sins, not just against etiquette, but that doesn't mean that the clergy must condone it. They themselves may be tempted to do the wrong thing for noble sake of accruing income or popularity for their congregations, but they are supposed to resist this temptation. End of quote of Miss Manners. How many people understand that the institution of marriage, consecrated at the wedding ceremony, is neither of human design nor of human interpretation? So headship is reflected in the wedding vows, and now, uh, and for the rest of the time, we're just going to go through the wedding ceremony step by step and show the role that headship plays at every point in the, in the classic uh, wedding ceremony. The first step in this is called the posting of the bands. This, uh, this was initially found in the, in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, uh, 1549. And it's still the foundation of most wedding services today, though more often than not in a tongue truncated and bastardized form. And what it's basically said is that the bands must be asked three several Sundays or holy days in the service time, the people being present after the accustomed manner. And if the persons that would be married dwell in different parishes, the bands must be asked in both the parishes, and the curate of the one parish shall not solemnize the marriage between them without a certificate of the bands being there asked from the curate of the other parish, and so forth. So this has to be done on three several Sundays. In other words, it's not just done once. <clears throat> so what's the reason for the ban? Well, there's three there's several reasons, three reasons. The first is to avoid an illicit union. What the ban is, is when the pastor says, if anyone show reason why this man and this woman should not be joined in marriage, let him speak. Now in the ceremony it says, now or forever hold his peace, but originally it was on three Sundays before the wedding, so it would let him speak. And it was done in both churches, if there were different churches, different locations. So uh, if anyone understood that this was going to be an illicit union, how might it be an illicit union? Well, maybe the party's already married. Maybe the party was divorced in a way that would not permit remarriage. It was done to deter private ceremonies, deter the denial of past promises, such as a, private, a previous wedding, uh, to reinforce the weighty nature of the vows. Calvin's, uh, John Calvin in Geneva, his, uh, his session, that is the Board of Elders, constantly dealt with people who Calvin said, drank marriage together secretly. In other words, they were cohabiting. So this illicit union, cohabiting without the covenant, to keep within the bonds of consanguinity. This is consanguinity. It comes from the Latin con, which means together with, and sanguinous, which means of blood. So this is, uh, consanguinity is we don't marry our family members. And so the question then is, what is a family member? What are blood relatives? It's kinship by common descent. Uh, law, laws prohibiting incest govern this degree of kinship 
within which marriage is permitted. Um, these are almost universally prohibited within the second degree of consanguinity. The Christian church, on the other hand, has pro prohibited within four degrees of consanguinity. So what are the degrees? The first degree is a parent and a child. A man doesn't marry his daughter. The second degree is a sibling relationship. You don't marry your sister. The third degree is an uncle or aunt with a niece or nephew. The fourth degree is between first cousins. So the Christian church has been fairly consistent in saying you don't marry within first cousins. Now there are good genetic reasons for this, but this has been this has been the avoidance of an illicit union. It's also this illicit union is to keep forced marriages of the unwilling from taking place. To so this emphasizes the willing nature of the union. In other words, if anyone has just cause why this shouldn't happen, well, the person that's being forced should speak up and say, yeah, I don't want to do it, right? And so that's another reason why we avoid an illicit union, because these unions, these covenants are made with willing partners. Two, it's to remind those who are contemplating marriage of how serious it is. In the, Imagine this being read in in church three consecutive Sundays before you get married. You get the idea that this is a serious thing we're getting into. It's not like running off to Las Vegas and marrying a showgirl. And third, to facilitate the social and familial melding rather than eloping. This marriage ceremony, and by reading the bands, you know, you're we're giving opportunity for the families to understand that if they are not in favor of this, that they have an opportunity to speak up and to say why. So the biblical types, Jesus chooses the bride. This is not a general, but a particular call to, to individuals. Jesus purchases the bride. This is a particular atonement. Jesus publicly owns his own. There's no clandestine marriages to Christ. You know, Jesus said, he who will deny me publicly, I will deny. Modern implications. Well, you have time to consider the serious nature of the act ahead of you before you get married. Uh, no one's forcing you to take your vows. Number two, you chose and proposed to your wife, not vice versa. Even in our feminist age, in this area, most men and men still rule. That is, they're the ones doing the proposing. Even in societies with arranged marriages, did you know that it's the man's family that does the arranging, not the, not the daughter, not the family of the bride? Three, you had time to learn things about your wife prior to your vows. So there's at least three Sundays uh, before, the, before the union. And during that period you're, of learning, you're free to back out. This is, we use courtship and engagement sort of the same way. And since you both had the time and control, yet went ahead, the responsibility now is fully yours in the eyes of God. Okay, so the next part of the ceremony after the bands is the words of institution. I'm going to read the modern wording. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God in the presence of these witnesses to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Marriage is an honorable estate which God himself made, and it signifies to us the sacred union that is between Christ and his church. This holy estate Christ adored and made beautiful with his presence and first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Marriage is also commended by Paul to be honorable among men. So what is important about this? It's the recognition of how timeless marriage is and the transcultural nature of marriage and that it's monogamous. It's lifelong, it's heterosexual, and it's husband-led. Okay, the next is the words of warning. Now we had the bands, and you say, now we got warnings. Well, you see how solemn this is. This is all before the vow is made. And so the modern wording is, therefore marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, deliberately, soberly, in the fear of God, in accordance with the purposes for which it was instituted by God. So the importance is that we're not to be brute beasts, so our vows are important. 
We are made in the image of God, and our yes is to be yes, and our no is to be no. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin in you. You shall not you shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. And so this this words of warning that it's not to be entered into lightly, but reverently, deliberately, soberly in the fear of God is an important part of the ceremony. And it's leading up to the solemnity of what this vow means. So next in the ceremony comes a statement of the purpose of marriage. Now you'd think everyone would know what the purpose of marriage is, but this is a stating that the vow is being made for this purpose. So even though we may know these things, it's to be part of this ceremony in which the vow is made. And so this is the uh, modern wording. The union of husband and wife in heart, body, and mind is intended by God for their mutual joy, for the help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity, and when it is God's will for the procreation of children and their nurture and the knowledge and love of the Lord. So the importance uh, is that there are indicated three purposes of marriage. One, mutual society or companionship. The ceremony says for their mutual joy. Secondly, for help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity. This is taken to keep from sin, to be able to help one another to do righteousness and to not sin. And third, for uh, having children, for procreation, to be fruitful and multiply. The biblical foundations of these words are that Christ and his marriage to the bride has the same three purposes. What are the purpose when we come to Christ? Well, number one, for our mutual joy, that we may know the joy of the Lord. Number two, for our sanctification, that we may be kept from sin. And number three, that we be fruitful and multiply. It's the exact same thing. Okay, then there's the final reading of the bands actually in the ceremony. And this is the typically the only one that still occurs in uh, modern marriages. This is the modern wording. Into this holy estate, these two persons, and then their names are given, my name Bob and Debbie, come now to be joined. If any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him speak or else hereafter forever hold his peace. I require and charge you both that if either one of you know any reason why your marriage goes against the laws of God, you now tell me. For you can be certain that if any persons are joined together otherwise than as God's word allows, their marriage is not lawful, and they will give an account on the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts will be revealed. Okay, and so that's the this statement, the final reading of the bands. Now we have the declaration of consent. It often may seem to you in a wedding that the vows are repeated twice, and they are. You will notice that the first time it's will you or do you desire, and the second time it's do you. So this is this first time is called the declaration of consent. In other words, that you're a willing party to the vow that you're about to make. The second time is the actual vow. So it's testating before God and witnesses that you're willing to make this vow, and then it's making the vow. And so the consent is the name of the groom, the groom goes first, he's head. Will you have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor her, and keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others? Keep you only unto her as long as you both shall live. The man answers, I will. All right, so this is, he's giving his consent. He will have this, this woman. Then the bride says the same thing, only will you have this man to be your wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance, etc. And then, in fact, what's happening here is a telescoping together of two ceremonies. This will you ceremony used to be the betrothal service, and it very often occurred weeks, 
before the actual wedding service. And it, now both ceremonies are, are happening together. But it's important that the parties be willing if they're, if they're making a vow. The next is, and it's interesting, see the statement of the groom of his willingness to enter into this vow comes before the father transfers his authority as headship to the groom. Then the minister shall say, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Who gives this woman to be married to this man in weddings today? You know, feminism means that, you know, you say your mother, her mother and I. That's not what I said with my daughter. I said I do because it's my responsibility. It's not because I didn't want my wife to have any role in it. Certainly my wife and I discussed this young man and, and uh, the future union but it's it's actually the head's responsibility as I've covered from scripture. But even with the egalitarian, typically it's still the father that walks the bride down the aisle, and it's still the father who says her mother and I. So even that vestige, although in modern weddings, a lot of times they're out of the church and they find some other woman to walk the woman down, that like a, a a bridesmaid or something. And what they're doing is they're trying to overturn headship in every way they can. They don't like uh, male authority. So next we have the exchange of the vows. And now this is, this is actually it. All this has been leading up to the exchange of the vows. This is the heart of the wedding service. Nothing is as central to a wedding as the vows, save perhaps the conjugal act itself. That is the sexual intercourse that follows uh, the vows. You know, and for years, that was actually done after the wedding ceremony, the initial consummating of the of the union. And it was not done publicly, it was done privately, but it was, you would then really be one flesh, you would then be really married, the vow and the, and the act. Jesus said, <clears throat> you know, if you, or rather Paul said, but in the spirit of Christ, if you join yourself to a prostitute, you're becoming one flesh with her. So the, the sexual act and the vow are both parts of official wedding. So the original wording of this, the minister receiving the woman at her father shall cause the man to take the woman by the right hand, so either to give their troth to the other. So in other words, the, the bride's hand is taken from the father and put on the hand of the groom. Then once that this has been done, then the groom says, I, groom's name, take you, bride, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death separates us according to God's holy ordinance, and to this I guarantee my faithfulness. Now, when you listen to this, there's a phrase that is not said by the husband. See if you can hear the new phrase. The, the bride says everything the husband says, except she adds a phrase. So the minister, bride takes the groom's right hand, repeats after the minister. I, bride's name, take you, groom's name, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and obey till death separates us according to God's holy ordinance, and to that I guarantee my faithfulness. This obey, my wife Debbie said this vow. And my vow included, in addition to what I read here, which is the traditional vow, it said, with all my worldly possessions I thee endow. That meant as the head, I was to provide for her and was promising my provision, including everything I owned at that time and everything I would own in the future. It was very interesting. After the wedding, we had a wonderful wedding. It was beautiful. We had beautiful music, beautiful people, beautiful dresses, and you know, handsome tuxedos and wonderful packed, packed out standing room only. It's only standing room only church service I've ever been to where there are actually people sitting with the parents because there were so many people present. 
And it was, we had a trumpet and a string quartet, and it was just magnificent. And so after the wedding ceremony, you know, in the reception area or sometime, you know, you're talking to people and, and again and again, we heard, oh, such a beautiful ceremony, except for one thing. And there were typically women who said that. And they said, I didn't like Debbie saying that she would obey you. You know, even though it, it goes by very quickly, you know, and and Debbie knew what she was saying when she said that, you know, it um, is just detestable. And what it means is that men are free from responsibility. You know, if a wife doesn't have to obey, then the man doesn't have to deliver, right? And, you know, if who's in charge here? Well, it ends up being the bride very often. So this ceremony is, we need to recover it. And not just that we say the words and everybody, that no one knows what we're talking about, but we actually explain this, especially to, to our sons and daughters and to, to those that we're courting. And because this is not, and people say, well, it's culture. Well, yeah, there's cultural elements. We, we're not cutting goats and heifers in half. You know, you can say, well, you know, the bride's family on one side, the groom's family on the other side, you know, that's... But, but the fact of God holding us accountable for the words of our mouths, for God making two people one, for God instituting this covenant of marriage and, and holding us to account to that, it needs to be understood uh, by God's grace, uh, accepted with the joy that God has given us these for. It is to the joy of both the husband and the wife that they understand that they are not the same. There are things about us that are the same. And so just in closing, a husband promises to have and to hold, for better or for worse, richer or poor, sickness and health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. The wife promises all of that and adds, she will obey. Christ, in his headship, listen to me, Christian, Christ in his headship has and holds for better or worse. In sickness and in health, he loves and cherishes through death. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for the gift of companionship and sexual union. Thank you for beautiful brides and beautiful grooms. Lord, help us that our marriages might bring honor and glory to our head, Jesus Christ, and joy and fulfillment to our wives, our brides. Lord, may you raise up godly children and grandchildren from the unions of everyone who is listening to this podcast. I pray you bless them, give them wisdom and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Basic Training Podcast, taught by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available on Spotify and the Google and Apple Podcast apps also on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you want to contact us with any comments or questions, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and God bless. Andrew, do you uh, you go through this in in premarital counseling? Um, yeah, that um, quickly go through it, but uh, I make sure that particularly that the vows are uh, understood because I insist on these vows, and so uh, I'll make sure that they know what they'll be vowing. Yep. Yeah. I thought the words of warning uh, in the old version were interesting. To satisfy men's carnal lust and appetites. Um, 
So it's it's a little strange. It's like a kind of real negative. I mean, obviously you shouldn't go into marriage for that reason alone. But I saw they took it out of the modern wording. And then down on the purposes of marriage, they list that it, that protection against sexual immorality, which is great. But then in the modern one, they take that one out. Yeah. Well, David Bailey, Pastor David Bailey, is uh, fond of saying and often does, we can't be holier than God. You know, and when God's word includes statements, phrases, especially those of a sexual nature, uh, words that we will be coming to in a future podcast very soon, you know, that uh, we shouldn't blush. We shouldn't be ashamed uh, to talk about uh, carnal lust, you know, or um, or these other things. You know, I I once um, I once was sharing Christ with a student, and uh, I was a student at the time, and uh, the um, one of the objections the person had was that. Um, that somehow God had designed us to be to be full of sexual desire, but then frustrated because we couldn't act on that sexual desire until we got married. And uh, one of the statements that I made to that person is, yeah, but who said that we needed to wait 20 years to get married? You know, um, maybe, you know, in, in earlier days, people actually married you know, far younger, you know, it's said that uh, probably Mary uh, was probably a teenager, you know, when when she had Jesus in Bethlehem. But anyway, this is, it, it is true that our, the sexual desire of both men and women is a, is a pretty strong thing and that marriage is, uh, is really grace that uh, to give a legitimate righteous outlet without uh, to alleviate the temptation to sin. But I agree with you. It's very, very interesting that we've dropped that. Yes, sir. To whom it, the vow, the solemn, the, the solemn promise is made at the heart of the wedding. To whom are those made? Who is the party being addressed when you make the vow? Well, that's a very, that's a very good question. It's a vow being made from the from the groom to the bride and the bride to the groom in the presence of God. So, I mean, it's the idea is that that both God and the other party are being addressed. But it's to that I take you, I Bob take you Debbie, to be my lawfully wedded wife to have and to hold and so forth. I'm, I'm talking to her, but, but it's, you know, when you understand the, the, the aisle, you know, the sacrifice and the, the coming together before God and witnesses, you know, that, that it's, it's a holy vow made to each other. Yeah. I've often wondered, you know, some people after especially a difficult part in their in their marriage will quote renew their vows. And I, you know, I don't know how Andrew feels about that, but you know when you understand you know <laughs> to me the vows still stand. <laughs> you know, you don't need to renew them. You might need to remind yourself of them. You know, you might have a, a ceremony of repentance or something, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like, it's, I mean, renewing vows always, to, and I've been to some ceremonies of friends who've done this. I've actually participated in some, but it, it makes the vows seem like they're elastic, you know, like, uh, well, I didn't really mean it that then, so this time I really mean it. Well, I'm sorry, God took you at your meaning the first time, right? And I think your spouse did as well. 
And I, I think, you know, maybe psychologically they're helpful to people to say this is now a new new beginning. And, I you know, I'm all for grace, so I don't object too loudly. Yeah. So now that we're through the wedding ceremony, the next podcast will start with the husband's basic responsibilities. And more importantly... Not that I know everything, but what I hope to be able to share with you that I have gleaned from the many mistakes and the many uh, men that I've had the benefit of teaching me over the years, you know, as to what uh, what I should do um, to make it uh, to make it a better uh, a better marriage. Uh, I think maybe I told you of the John Wayne quote uh, from. the sands of Iwo Jima, uh, where he's uh, he's talking to young Marine recruits uh, at Paris Island, and he says, um, "Life is tough. It's a lot tougher if you're stupid." <laughs> and I and I think you know I'd like to say for this the husband part, marriage is tough. It's a lot tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and in fact. Wisdom in this is not very commonly shared anymore, but there is quite a bit that I think can make make a bad marriage good and make a good marriage better. And I look forward to sharing those things with you in coming podcasts. Thank you, guys. <laughs>